Welcome to the fourth program in our ongoing series of presentations on seeing Hashem's hand in nature, history, and our daily lives. The Meaningful Tefillah Project at Young Israel Shomri Amuna offers these free programs to help us better appreciate the presence of Hashem in the world around us and to strengthen our faith and inspire our prayers in difficult times. We are pleased to have Kent Mill Synagogue as a co-sponsor of this series. Our first three lectures explored some of the wonders of nature seen to the eyes of top scientists. On Sunday, July 24th, we will hear from Mrs. Sharon Freundel, who will speak on the topic of seeing Hashem's hand in our daily lives. For updates of future programs, send your email address to me at stuartrosenthal at yais.org. Past recordings are posted on YouTube's Meaningful to Feel a Project channel. We thank Rabbi Rosenbaum of Young Israel Shomer Amuna and Rabbi Weinberg of KMS for their support of this series. I also want to thank the sponsors whose contributions make these programs possible. Cheryl and Ken Jacobson, Debbie and Mark Katz, Debbie and Max Rudman, and Karen and Daniel Moshinsky. In addition, I would like to dedicate today's program in memory of my dear parents, Leonard and Arlene Rosenthal of Blessed Memory. Additional sponsors of these ongoing programs are welcome. Please contact me or the Young Israel office. It is now my pleasure to welcome Rabbi Yitzchak Breitowitz, well known in this community as Rabbi Emeritus of Woodside Synagogue, to speak on the topic, Seeing Hashem's Hand in History. Rabbi Breitowitz is joining us now from Yerushalayim, where he serves as Rav of Kehilat Or Sameach and Senior Lecturer at Yeshivat Or Sameach. Just to offer a brief synopsis of his accomplishments, I would like to mention that Rabbi Breitowitz obtained his smicha from their Israel Rabbinical College in Baltimore, graduated magna cum laude from Harvard Law School, clerked for a U.S. District Court judge, practiced law, and then taught at both the University of Illinois and University of Maryland School of Law. But none of that expresses the impact that Rabbi Breitowitz has had as a widely published writer on Jewish law and ethics, as a speaker greatly in demand throughout the U.S. and Israel on a wide variety of contemporary issues and problems, and as an approachable and caring Rav, addressing congregants' personal issues with sensitivity and wisdom. We are so fortunate today to have our Rabbi Dewitz to ourselves for the next hour, to hear him speak about Hashem's hand in history, and as time permits, answer some questions. Please type any questions and comments you have in the chat window, and Rabbi Rosenbaum will select, um, reluct, will select some to ask our Rabbi Dewitz when he concludes his remarks. Rabbi Dewitz, thank you again for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Stuart, for the very kind introduction. I also appreciate your making me feel at home with some of the local scenery. Mm -hmm. In the background of, of the old city, and uh, uh, Rabbi Rosenberg and Weinberg, it's good, good to, to see you, and it's good to see uh, many, many familiar faces. I uh, obviously have a tremendous affection uh, for the Silver Spring community, and I just want you to know, I will not charge you a finder's fee, but when people ask me where they should move to Chutz Laaretz, mm -hmm. I very, very much put uh, the various parts of Silver Spring at very much uh, high on the list. So, uh, it's uh, so good to uh, be connected again. Uh, the issue that I'm going to talk about today, seeing God in history, is something that the Torah itself says we're supposed to do. It says in Parshas Hazinu, Sha'al avicha v'yagetcha zekeinecha v'yemru lach. Ask your father about what had happened in the past, and he will tell you. Ask your elders. The concept is that we understand that the God of Israel, the supreme God of the world, the one and only God, is not only the God of creation, but is the God of history. In point of fact, the Ramban says that this is the very significance of the Ten Commandments, the famous question. Review Dalevi asks, why does it say, I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt? It ought to say, I am the Lord your God who created heaven and earth. Very famous question. And some answers are, well, nobody was around to see creation of heaven and earth. But what the Ramban's own answer is, because there were many religious beliefs who actually believed that God created the world, but was then not involved in the affairs of man. This is called deism, kind of the notion there is this God, but the God is the God of nature, and he's not really involved in our lives. God wanted to underscore that I am not only the God of creation, but I am, I am involved in the historical processes that occur. We call this hashkocha, God's providence, hashkocha pratis. Now, granted, there are some enormous philosophical questions. I'll just throw out a question. 
I'm not really going to address it that much today, but it's something to ponder. How do you, uh, what is the intersection between human free will and God's divine providence. On one end, we say God has a master plan, and the master plan is geared towards certain results in history that God wants to achieve and will achieve through the cumulative actions of millions and billions of actors. At the same time, we have this concept that human beings are free agents. There is bechira chavshit. There is free will. Now. Let's take, it, let's take it in a micro review. A person walks into a 7-Eleven, two o'clock in the morning, and is a victim of an armed robbery. Now, on one hand, uh, did God make the a robber pull the trigger? Absolutely not. The, the armed robber had Bechira to shoot or not to shoot. Hakobi de Shemayim, everything is in the hands of heaven, except the decision to be virtuous, to fear God. On the other hand, if God didn't want that person to die at that exact moment, for whatever reason, it wouldn't have happened. So what would have happened had the robber at the last minute done shuva and not pulled the trigger? Uh, would the person in the store have gotten a heart attack? Would the building have fallen down? Meaning, how do you reconcile God's overall plan with the fact that individual actors within that framework have free will? That's an enormously complicated question, and it's one that I'm going to avoid right now. Some of you think about, but nevertheless, it's implicit in the notion of Hashkacha that God is the God of history and not simply the God of creation. And God has plans. And after all, this is the message of the Torah itself. The Torah tells us over and over again, if there's going to be sins, there's going to be galut and korban, and all of these things have happened. And then there's going to be Gaula. So I really want to talk about two distinct aspects of this. And they're not that related, but they're somewhat connected in the notion of God intervening in history. The first is a topic that's especially popular in Eretz Israel, and maybe in an excessive and dangerous way sometimes. And that is the notion of viewing current events through a messianic prism. There's a lot of different talk going around about Chavlei Mashiach, the birth pains of Mashiach, Ikvasa de Mashiach, the heels of Mashiach, the wars of Gog and Magog, the Galut of Yishmael, which I'll get to in a moment, particularly the metaphysical, spiritual significance of Russia invading the Ukraine. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about that, and then I want to say why perhaps that's not necessarily something that would be so helpful for us to focus on, although there are going to be some insights that I think are valuable. Uh, first, all of us know the teaching of our sages that before the coming of Mashiach, there will be a time of great upheavals. And this is compared to Chavle Leida, just as before a woman gives birth, there are labor pains. So too, before the ultimate redemption, there are going to be cataclysmic difficult events. There will be wars. According to some sources, there will be plagues. Read COVID uh, in there. Uh, there will be various things that are going to be happening. So I want to share with you five teachings of the Vilna Gaon that are th something to think about. First, we know that the final messianic wars we don't know exactly what they are, and maybe they've happened already, and hopefully they have happened already. But they're described as the wars of Gog and Magog. Now, this does not mean Gog against Magog. Rather, Gog is described as the king of Eretz Magog, and that is described as a country of the north. And that'll be the final struggle against Jerusalem. And in the aftermath of Gog and Magog, there will be redemption and the coming of Mashiach and David. There is an old Mesorah from the Vilna Gaon that the war of Gog and Magog will last for 12 minutes. And for 200 years, no one really understood the sense of that statement. What type of war could, could possibly last for 12 minutes? Unfortunately, it's a quite dubious blessing, but unfortunately our generation understands very well what type of war could last for 12 minutes? It's a nuclear war. And coupled with the Vilna Gaon identifying Gog 
as none other than Russia, that <laughs> kind of can scare you quite a lot in terms of understanding this in an, ap in an apocalyptic way as uh, a harbinger of the war of Gog and Magog, possibly even a nuclear holocaust. But then I want to bring out a second teaching of the Vilna God that's extremely important as a modifier of this. And that is, there is a Gog and Magog script of horrible wars. And uh, we are told there's a Moshiach ben Yosef who precedes Moshiach ben David and he will be killed in the wars of Gog and Magog. But the Vilna Gaon says, this script is not inevitable. The Vilna Gaon says, Mashiach can come in two different ways, as the Gemara and Sanhedrin says. Uh, there is a final designated time for Mashiach, whether we're deserving or not, and that will require this entire process, this entire script. But Mashiach can also be accelerated by Tshuva and Masin Tovin and Avat Yisrael. And the Vilna Gaon said, if we can bring the Geula by our Tshuva and our Masin Tovin and our Avat Yisrael, we can bypass the death of Mashiach and Yosef and the cataclysms of Gog and Magog. This is referred to in the Gemara as Ita and Achishena. Ita means a designated time. Achishena means God could hurry it. And the Chavle Mashiach and the wars of Gog and Magog and the death of Mashiach ben Yosef in whole or in part are only part of the Ita, the Ita Geula. But the Geula that comes through an Achishana can bypass all of those different things. And uh, yet another statement of the Vilna Gaon, again, more than uh, 250 years ago, when Russia enters the Crimea, you will hear the bells of Mashiach. And if Russia ever gets as far as Constantinople, put on your Shabbos clothes because Mashiach is here. And of course, the Gemara Sanhedrin says that on the Shemitah year before Mashiach, there will be tremendous milchamot and Ben David will come the eighth year of Shemitah. So, I'm sorry, in other words, the eighth year, the year after Shemitah, the first year after Shemitah next year. So you can imagine that there are many messianic speculators who are really, really aflame over all of these interesting, scary, somewhat frightening ideas. And, you know, who knows? There are many, many possibilities in life of which we're not aware. But I just want to cite a well-known passage of the Rambam in Hilchos Molochim, where the Rambam greatly, based, based on a chazal, greatly discourages us from engaging in excessive messianic speculation. Because he says, number one, we don't know. Number two, it's dangerous because if we start, if we start predicting as people predict, next year Mashiach is coming and it doesn't happen, people, God forbid, can lose their faith. And number three, too much of a focus on Mashiach can sometimes distract a person from their responsibilities in this world. I believe uh, Rav Lapiansky Shlita had a very, very wonderful article in Mishpacha magazine called Sometimes Mashiach is not the answer. And he was making the point that when we focus too much on Mashiach, we don't always envision the here and now imperatives of life. And the final reason the Rambam gives is that messianic speculation does not bring a person to Ava Tashem and Yira Tashem. And our orientation is, I believe in Geula. I yearn for Geula. I pray to Hashem for the Geula Shlema to come, the Karov B'Ameinu. But I understand I'm not in a position to link specific events to the Messianic process. Uh, Christians do it a lot. You may know this if you ever look around. Uh, and uh, in Eretz Israel, quite a few amateur Kabbalists dabble in this. And I think it is very interesting. But as I say, I, I, I tend myself not to overemphasize it exactly for the reasons that the Rambam gives. One should not be trying to figure out the actual end, end of days. But there's another messianic point that you want to make before I leave this. And that is... In the book of Daniel, 
we find the notion of four kingdoms that shall rule the Jewish people until the coming of Mashiach. We're not counting Mitzrayim, we're counting the four kingdoms from the time we came to Eretz Israel. We have the Malchus of Babel, Babylonia, and Nebuchadnezzar, who destroyed the first temple. And the Babylonian empire was conquered by Persia. And they allowed us, well, there was the Purim story, the genocide of Purim, or the near genocide, but it ended with Daryavish II, who was the son of Achashverosh and Esther, authorizing the rebuilding of the second temple in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. Eventually, the Persian Empire was conquered by Alexander the Great, that represents Yavan, Greece, and uh, the Hanukkah story happened at some point there. And then finally, Greece was toppled by the Roman Empire, Golos Edom, said to be descended from Esau, from Edom, and they destroyed the second Beis HaMikdash. Maral says, very interestingly, that each of these Goliot has a distinct character. The Galut of Bavel is subjugation. They are the ones that enslaved us. They took away our freedom. They destroyed our Beis HaMikdash. You see, Persia, Greece, and Rome already conquered a subjugated people. It was only Bavel that took away our political freedom initially. So Bavel represents subjugation. Yavan, I'm sorry, Paras, Persia, represents genocide, or at least attempted genocide. Yavan represents cultural assimilation. Because the Hanukkah story was about that assimilation. And Edom is the longest of all the Goliath, but Edom is a composite, that within Edom, you will find subjugation, persecution, you will find genocide, like the Holocaust, you will find assimilation, like the United States and other Western countries. In other words, Edom does not in itself have its own identity, but Edom is a composite of uh, Bavel, Paras, Yavan. Now, according to most understanding, conventional understanding, we are still in Golos Edom. Now, why are we in Golos Edom? The Roman Empire ceased to exist. The Western Roman Empire fell in 476 of the Common Era, and the uh, Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, is 1453. So why are we still in Golos Edom? So there are a number of reasons why we're characterized as the Golot of Edom. Reason number one uh, is that the Chorban of Edom has not been reversed. The temple has not been rebuilt. Reason number two is Rome became the seat of Christianity and the Jewish people's faith has been largely linked to Christian cultures. And reason number three is Western civilization came from Greece via Rome, and therefore we are still in Edom. So the conventional understanding of the book of Daniel is we have four Goliot, and let me just remind you, if you check your Ma'os Sur Hanukkah story, you will see indeed it is based on the four Goliot. However, Pirkei de Rebbe Eliezer actually tells us that before the coming of Mashiach, there will be a fifth Goliot that will be an add-on to the Golot of Edom, and that is the ascendancy of Yishmael. That Yishmael will become part of Edom, and indeed, Maral points out, this is quite amazing, it will re-establish a tie with long defunct Paras. In other words, not only will Yishmael link with Edom, but Yishmael will link with Paras. Now, as you know, the Arab nations are largely descended from Yishmael. And Paras, although Paras is an Islamic country, it's a non-Arabic country, but Paras is ancient Persian. Iran, the collaboration of the Arab world with Iran will be the final step before the Messianic Ula. And as a result, we are confronted with the Golas of Edom. But within the Golas of Edom, you have the collaboration of Yishmael together with Paras. And Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer says 
Yishmael is the most dangerous galut of all. Because unlike Edom, which comes with, comes with brute force, Yishmael comes with spiritual merit. The merit of Brit Milah. The merit of circumcision, Yishmael had. The merit of prayer, right? A Muslim's daven five times a day. The merit of tzniyut. Now, this may sound very, very strange that on one hand you have murderous people who practice terrorism, but there's still a certain spiritual kolach they have. And Pirkei to Rabbi Eliezer, it is a medrash. It's a medrash that dates to around the year 600 of the Common Era, right around the ascendancy of Islam uh, in the Middle East. And it actually says, this will be the worst of all. Rav Chaim Vital, the Talmud of the Ari, develops this theme at great length in his commentary to Tehillim, uh, Kuf Chaf 124, the Golos of B'nai Yishmael and the Hischabrut to press. And if you think about it, the Golos of Yishmael is by far the most dangerous because they are no longer working with rational calculations. You know, for most of the Cold War, what preserved the relative peace in the world was a doctrine that was aptly named MAD, mutually assured destruction. Meaning we knew the old Soviet Union was not gonna send an atom bomb against us because they knew that the second strike would wipe them out. And since they didn't wanna be destroyed, they wouldn't try to destroy us. And that was the rational calculation that justified an arms race based on mutually assured destruction and it more or less, putting aside Korea and Vietnam, but more or less it prevented world wars for 50 years. But that presupposes a rational actor. That presupposes the notion that I don't want to do something that will cause me to be blown up. What happens if you take the position that being blown up is a virtue and I will get some great reward out of it? At that point, there is literally no deterrent. That is the situation to some degree. Again, I'm not saying completely in a lot of Islamic fundamentalism. What makes it extraordinarily dangerous, now again, the leaders have their self-interest. That's very, very true. But the rank and file that is willing to get blown up in a bus or whatever it is, conventional deterrents don't work. So no matter how many army you have, how many policemen, I mean, what are you gonna do? I live in a place where uh, two years ago, um, there were terrorists who were just turning their cars into people waiting at a light rail stop. They would just drive into people. Now, what are you going to do? Uh, take away cars? You know, uh, there's really no conventional deterrence. Although, Baruch Hashem, the Israeli army, the Israeli police do a fantastic, excellent job, and all of us are very, very grateful. But again, this highlights the danger of Yishmael, which is described in the Torah as Pere Adam. Pere Adam is a wild person that is beyond rational calculation that in a sense, they're really unstoppable except by spiritual means. And this was foreseen in Pere de Rabbi Eliezer that talks about the ascendancy of B'nai, of B'nai Yishmael, Galut Yishmael, and they point out there's only two nations in the world that have God's name in their national identity Yisrael, Yishmael, highlighting the notion that the only way you defeat Yishmael, you have to have Hishtadlus with an army, but ultimately, since they represent some dark spiritual force, you can only combat them with spirituality. Now, another aspect of this Golot Yishmael, which manifests itself in many, many other ways as well, is a sense that there is no place that is safe. You know, people sometimes say, Oh, I can't move to Israel because Israel is so dangerous. Well, tragically, I think uh, all of my friends in the United States understand that life in the United States is getting increasingly dangerous as well. And Europe, England, France, Germany, wherever it is, whether it's against the Jewish population or the non-Jewish population, there seems to be a certain instability that's been permeating the world on many levels. It started maybe with Islamic fundamentalism. It then turns into movements like Black Lives Matter or defunding the police 
or the collapse of economies or the supply shortages that I think some of you are, are experiencing. Uh, COVID in which we thought we had created a society in which systems were relatively stable and all of a sudden the world came to a virtual standstill for almost three years. I think what's going on is, and this can create a lot of psychological problems, is a lack of stability, a lack of a sense that you're standing on firm ground. Things are changing all the time and there's no way to predict what's going on. And that could create helplessness and hopelessness, but it can also be the seeds of great hope. Because when we realize there is so little that we can do, that we're not in control of our lives, that kind of makes us realize, as the Mishnah says in Masech Sota, Ein lanu lihisha'en ela alavinu shabashamayim. That it's not up to me anymore. I got to do my part. But ultimately, it's in God's hands. They tell the story of the Briska Rav, the great Rav of Brisk, Rav uh, Yitzhak Zev Salavetri, who lost, I mean, he lost his uh, wife and some children in the Holocaust. Uh, and he generally was kind of a nervous temperament. He was always worried about this and that. But in the Warsaw Ghetto, people noticed he was unnaturally calm. And someone had the chutzpah to ask him, you know, Rebbe, you're always so nervous about everything. How can you become in a ghetto where people are dying of starvation, of murder, of disease? Uh, how could you become in a time like this? And he answered, I'm nervous when Hashem gave me a responsibility and I'm not sure I carried it out properly. But when I'm in a situation where there's absolutely nothing I can do, then I actually relax because I give it over to God. And in some ways, I think that's what a lot of us are, are, are feeling in this very, very turbulent time. On one hand, it can drive you crazy. On the other hand, take a deep breath and say, listen, God does run the world. I got to do what I can. I have to be responsible, whether it's taking safety precautions in our schools. And I hope that all of you are very sensitive to that in light of the tragedies that are going on in school shootings, whether it be taking the COVID uh, precautions in whatever way you, you take them. But ultimately, we know that there's so much that's beyond our control. And for a believer, that can still be a source of strength. So once again, it's so fascinating that the Galut Yishmael was predicted so early and yet we see it playing out. And there's another aspect as well. Uh, there is another, yeah, I understand. I, I think uh, so, someone wants to make the point that Arabs are not listed. Uh, listen, the Chazals and the Sora is very clear. I understand some historians differ, but there's absolutely no question that Chazal identified the Arabs as being descended from Ishmael with, with intermarriage with the other B'nai Ketula. The Rambam, the Rambam himself writes, that B'nai Yishmael did marry with their brethren, B'nai Keturah, and that formed uh, the, the Arab nation. So, so I'm going with Chazal's understanding. Again, a lot of what Chazal say, historians dispute. Chazal's identification of the Romans with Edom is also not, not agreed upon by many, many historians, but uh, I'm working with the, uh, the identifications that Chazal gave us. I also want to point out one other point, and then I'm going to go to the second half of my remarks, which I think might even be more helpful and useful. And that is, there is a concept in Kabbalah that comes across in many, many ways. And that is, we are vulnerable to outside forces only when we have some type of defect within us that makes us vulnerable to those outside forces. So even Amalek, that is the epitome of evil, Amalek on the outside has an achiza, can grab us only because there is some aspect of Amalek that is within us. And therefore the mitzvah of mechiyat Amalek is not only getting rid of the external Amalek, which indeed we must, but it also refers to an mechiyat Amalek, mi 
So the Amaleks of the world don't have an Achiza. It may be suggested, this is based on another teaching of the Vilna Gaon, that Esav and Yishmael represent two spiritual dilemmas that function within us. That is, Esav represents hedonistic materialism. Remember what Esav said when Esav comes back starving, and Esav says, Hine anochi holech lamut, behold, I'm going to die. There's no life after this world. Lama, lama zeli b'chora. Why do I need the firstbornship, the spiritual heritage? So Esav represents what you might call the accomplishments of Western civilization, the technology, the wealth, the power, the influence, right? Hedonistic materialism. Yishmael, although they too have their share of that hedonistic materialism, but at least on the fundamentalist level, represents the notion of appropriating God for evil and despicable purposes. Meaning the ace of direction is trying to ignore God by creating a new God of money, power, and technology. Yishmael is very God conscious, but besmirching God by using God in negative and destructive ways. And within our own personalities, I think we can identify these tendencies in different ways. To the extent we become enamored with money and power and technology, we become vulnerable to the ASOVs of the world. To the extent our religious fanaticism causes sinat chinam, machlokes, and hatred of other Jews, we might become vulnerable to the Ishmael tendency. So as a result, the tug of war of Esav and Ishmael, both of which are against us, may reflect tensions within our own personalities. And therefore, as is always the case, we should start with ourselves. Again, let me be very, very clear. I'm not suggesting that we ignore external enemies. Certainly we need our security services, our police, our, um, our armies, our military, our intelligence, by all means, that is the Ishtadlut that we have to engage with in the world. But we also have to understand that ultimately, when we're going through difficult times, there has to be a spiritual accounting and a spiritual cheshbon hanefesh. And that is why the last galut is Esav Yishmael, because they represent our two nisyonos, the Nisayan of hedonistic materialism of Western civilization and the Nisayan of religious fanaticism uh, coming from Islamic fundamentalism and the, and, and the like. And of course, keep in mind, when Yishmael combines with Paras, Paras was the originator of genocide all the way back to Haman, etc. So there's always that very poisonous combination. So this is like one aspect of more recent history, more recent current events that we try to link to various patterns and various musr and various things that we can do in our own life. But I want to now talk about another aspect, which is, Baruch Hashem is actually more pleasant, but it's something to think about. And that is the wonder of Jewish history at all. In other words, we say, see God in history. The fact that there is a history is perhaps the greatest wonder of all. Um, Mark Twain, now I, I have a special affection for Mark Twain, although Mark Twain uh, uh, grew up in Missouri. He spent his adult years in Hartford, Connecticut, and I am a, uh, not a native, but I came to Hartford as a two-year-old. And Mark Twain's house is in West Hartford, Connecticut. So that was a favorite place we would go to on school trips. So me and Mark Twain are buddy, buddy. And uh, Mark Twain was not Jewish, a wonderful writer. But at one point, Mark Twain penned a letter about the Jews because he was accused of being anti-Semitic. And he wrote a letter defending himself that he was not anti-Semitic. But I want to read you part of this letter uh, that Mark Twain pointed out. And this letter is on the internet. So uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm not posting it up, but uh, you can get it on the internet. And here is what he says. If the statistics are right, the Jews constitute but 1% of the human race. It suggests a nebulous dim puff of a stardust lost in the blaze of the Milky Way. Properly, 
the Jew ought hardly to be heard of, but he is heard of, has always been heard of. He is as prominent on the planet as any other people. His commercial importance is extravagantly out of proportion to the smallness of his bulk. Well, maybe a little anti-Semitism there about Jews having money, but okay. His contributions to the world's list of great names in literature, science, art, music, finance, medicine, and abstruse learning are way out of proportion to the weakness of his numbers. He has made a marvelous fight in this world in all ages. He has done it with his hands tied behind his back. He could be vain of himself and be excused for it. The Egyptian, the Babylonian, the Persian rose and filled the planet with sound and splendor and then faded to dream stuff and passed away. The Greek and the Roman followed and made a vast noise and they are gone. Other people have sprung up and held their torch high for a moment, but it burnt out and they sit in twilight or have vanished. The Jews saw them all, beat them all, and is now what he always was, exhibiting no decadence, no infirmities of age, no weakening of his heart, no slowing of his energies, no dulling of his alert and aggressive mind. All things are mortal but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immorality? And this is from the article concerning the Jews in Harper's Magazine of 1899. Mark Twain happened to be an atheist. So indeed he had a Tzorichian. What is the secret of his immoral immortality? We, Baruch Hashem, have an answer. It is frankly a miracle. Maral of Prague actually says that this is why Brit Milah, circumcision, is on the eighth day of creation. The covenant is connected to eight. The natural cycle of the world is a seven day cycle. God makes the world for six days, and then we have Shabbat, and then we start again. So the cycle of nature is connected to seven. What is eight? Eight is above nature. Eight is beyond historical causality, beyond natural processes. Maral says the Jew is above nature. This is not just a Kabbalistic abstract idea. It makes no sense that we are here. You know, uh, years ago, there was a very famous British historian, Arnold Toynbee, who wrote a classic multi-volume work called A Study in History. And he analyzed 50 ancient civilizations, Egyptians, Sumerians, Babylonians, Persians, all the way to the Greeks and the Romans, 50. And he tried to identify common patterns that explain the rise and fall of those civilizations. So imagine the amount of data he had to amass to be able to formulate what he called the laws of historical causality. And Baruch Hashem, ingeniously, he managed to propose various theories that explain when does a civilization flourish? When does it disintegrate? And his theories worked for 49 out of the 50 civilizations he examined. It didn't work for the Jewish people because he talked about the need to have a common language, which most of the Jews did not have. Most Jews did not speak Hebrew for most of our history the need to have a territory. Most of our time, we were not on Eretz right? So all of the things that keep nations together, we did not have. And basically, in fact, they say Toynbee happened to be an anti-Semite, but you know, I say jokingly, I don't blame him so much. If I worked on a voluminous theory that explained 49 out of 50, but it's this one nation that kind of ruins the theory, I would get mad too. I would be angry at him. Right? So I, maybe that's why he was a little anti-Semitic. But because of this, Toynbee basically said, the Jews are a fossil, meaning the existence of the Jews makes as much sense as finding a, a dinosaur uh, you know, in, 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 the, uh, in a forest, like a fossil that somehow survived. And in the 1960s, this was a very famous debate uh, between Arnold Toynbee and, uh, and, and Yaakov Herzog, that's the, that's the uncle of the 
present president of Israel and the brother of Chaim Herzog, the son of Chief Rabbi Yitzchak Herzog. And uh, Yaakov Herzog was actually a religious man and a Talmud Chacham, but a very, very brilliant academic scholar as well. And if you check even YouTube, you can get old videos of what is called the Herzog Toynbee debate. Are Jews a fossilized people or are they a real people? But I'll tell you, I think Toynbee has a real point. Because if Toynbee's argument is that Jewish existence is a defiance of the laws of history, my answer is, you're right, they are. They are ahistorical, they are above history. Maral writes, that is exactly the symbolism of a Brit Milah being on the eighth uh, day. And uh, there is no logic for Jewish existence. For Yaakov Emden writes, you know, people ask the question, why doesn't God do open miracles today? Why doesn't God split the Red Sea or whatever it is? Yvanka Vemden said, if people would contemplate the survival of the Jewish people, they would see a greater miracle than the Yitzhiyat Mitzrayim and Kriyas Yamsa. And when I say survival, it's as Mark Twain himself said, it doesn't just mean, you know, survival, we're in a cave, you know, we, we managed to kind of hide out. We're talking about creativity, contribution. Again, it, as a religious Jew, it is sad to, for me that most of our, our Jewish brethren and sisters are not observing the Torah. That is very sad. But the point is, even those who do not observe the Torah, look at the contributions that they've made. I mean, I know that maybe it's superficial, but look at the percentage of Nobel Prizes that Jewish people have won. And I don't mean things like the Peace Prize, which is kind of a cheating a cheater prize but you know prizes of real significance in physics and medicine literature and 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 the like you know if you ask the average non-jew what percentage of the world's population are jewish they will tell you oh it must be 25 percent 30 percent 40 percent you know you hear about jews all the time for good or for bad <laughs> you know and really we're such a tiny 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 little percentage so something's going on here. There's some special hashgacha practice. There is some special chosenness. It's not the chosenness of arrogance, of gaiva, of looking down, but it's the chosenness of responsibility, of trying to give something to the world, of trying to make the world a better place. And God kept us around for that. I mean, look at the Holocaust. Many of you have either parents or grandparents or uncles or aunts or great uncles or great aunts who suffered through this Holocaust. A devastation in which one of the most sophisticated nations in the world tried to systematically eradicate us from the face of the earth. And the losses that we suffered, men, women, child, six million. And look, Again, I'm not going to address the theological questions of why God allowed it to happen. Those are hard questions to be sure. But just look at how we have flourished and rebuilt. We'll come to Eretz Israel, and I got willing, I hope uh, you'll, now that COVID is a little less restrictive, uh, you can come. I see the background, <laughs> again, the starts background of Yerushalayim, and see what is going on not only in terms of population growth, but in terms of science, technology, in terms of Torah, in terms of mitzvahs. We're kind of, again, I don't want to sound triumphalist because this is not looking down at anybody, but we're kind of invincible as a nation. But it's not because of us. It's because of Hashem's special hashgach, that we don't get broken. We go on. As Rav Salvechik said, the year that he lost his mother, his brother, and his wife, says Hashem made many worlds that he destroyed before he made this world. And why did Hashem do that? To teach us a lesson that even when our world is destroyed, we go on and we create. We don't give up. And that is divine. That is truly, truly, truly miraculous. One has to understand this. This is a lesson our children need to understand. There is no logical reason based on the laws of history or precedent that there ought to be a Jewish people. And again, 
numerous ancient civilizations are literally gone. Civilizations do get extinct. It's not just animals or plants. Civilizations get extinct. But the Jewish people is still here. So this is something that's kind of a meta phenomenon of Amisha. And that's in spite of our dispersion, our gullus, anti-Semitism, which never goes away, no matter what. In spite of the fact of genocides, it goes on. And Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, we go on. But there's something else to keep in mind too. And that is, it is not only the survival of Am Yisrael, but Am Yisrael's connection to Eretz Yisrael. Now, Eretz Yisrael is a very, very strange country. And here I want to read you something else from Mark Twain. And I apologize for quoting Mark Twain so much. Mark Twain wrote a travel log in the 19th century. One of his books was called Innocence Abroad. This is much earlier. This goes back to 1869. And he describes a visit to the Middle East. And he describes what Jerusalem was like. Now, remember, there were very few Jews in Israel or Jerusalem in the 19th century. They began coming in the latter half of the 19th century, etc., in larger numbers. Uh, so this is, you had, you know, the few, well, they weren't even called Palestinians then, but whatever it was, the, the local Arab populations with a small group of Jews called the Yishuv Hayashan, the old Yishuv. And here's what Mark Twain says. We traverse some miles of desolate country whose soil might be rich enough, but is given wholly to weeds, a silent, mournful expanse. A desolation is here that not even imagination can grace with the pomp of life and action. We never saw a human being on the whole route. We pressed on towards the goal of our crusade, renowned Jerusalem. But the further we went, the hotter the sun, the more rocky and bare, repulsive and dreary the landscape became. There was hardly a tree or a shrub anywhere. Even the olive and the cactus, those friends of a worthless soil, had deserted the country. No landscape exists that is more tiresome to the eye than that which bounds the approaches to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is mournful, dreary, and lifeless. I would not want to live there. It is hopeless, dreary, heartbroken. Palestine sits in sackcloth and ashes. Over it broods the spell of a curse that has withered its fields and fettered its energies. Palestine is desolate and ugly. Mark Twain, Innocence of the Gemara tells us, based on a Pasuk in Yechesel, that Eretz Yisrael yields its produce only to its children who return to the land. When we return to the land, like a mother, the land of Israel gives us fertility. And when we are not in the land, the land shuts down and no other nation is able to make anything from that land. And this is in the Talmud. This is in the Talmud Ksuvos. And historically, it just happens to be true. Now, of course, you could say, well, uh, the Arabs, whoever, had primitive agricultural techniques and we're smarter and we're more sophisticated and we have better technology. Okay, okay, I, I can't conclusively, you know, argue with you there. But Chazal say there's a spiritual idea as well. The land itself is in Galut when we are in Galut. And when we return, the land opens up. And we've seen this in our lifetime. You come to Eretz Israel today, you will see the fertility, you will see the fruits and the vegetables and the grain and the uh, all sorts of things. In addition to startup nation technology, which is another type of productivity, but you'll see the beauty of the agricultural fertility because the Jews are coming home. And when they come home, mom prepares all the best food for the kids when they come home. And that's, Baruch Hashem, what we see in our own lifetime. So 
this, I think we do live in a very, very scary world. There is no question about it. And it's a very unpredictable world. Like, again, I, without getting alarmist, Russia, Ukraine is a very scary situation simply because it has, well, it has left the bonds of rationality. I mean, you say Putin's behavior, the clown makes no political sense, even from a Russian perspective. And the problem is when things don't make any sense, then you, you cannot predict where they're going to go. Because, uh, I mean, he even looks at himself as a messianic figure, so, bizarrely enough, and, and the like. So we live in a very scary and unpredictable world. But what is happening is that we also see signs of redemption, signs of goodness. More and more Jews are coming to our, so again, I'm not here to, to push Aliyah. I mean, <laughs> everyone has to make their, their own decisions on that. But one has to think, are we getting messages that it's kind of time to come home? Maybe the Galut is coming to an end on some level and we got to put our faith in. The one thing I can tell you is uh, that the argument that Israel is a dangerous place to live is demonstrably false, meaning I cannot say that it is, I mean, depends where you live, but generally speaking, it is not more dangerous than other countries. Uh, and uh, therefore, if it's dangerous everywhere, you know, one might think maybe oh, I might as well be here. It's, it's dangerous no matter where, no matter where I, uh, where I go. So these are, are some things uh, to think about. On one hand, we can't ever be so sure about a messianic process, as the Rambam says. We cannot be machashev asaketz. But we do have to have a sense of what is going on and what is what are the messages that God might be telling us. We have to approach it with humility. We have to approach it with not really knowing, knowing for sure. But nevertheless, you know, what is logical? What are the messages? And maybe have the courage to go beyond our comfort zone and take the steps uh, that, uh, that we, we need to take. So again, uh, be happy to take uh, a few uh, questions or comments. And uh, thank you, it was really very nice to see you all again. And I wish you much, much Hatzlacha. Um, I hope I'll be able to uh, travel to the US soon. But uh, once again, I, uh, gotten out of the habit of traveling, so it's a little hard to get back into the habit of traveling. But the answer is Hashem. I hope to uh, see you either here, here, or there. So thanks so much. Thank you, Rabbi. Rabbi thank, Rabbi. You, thank you. Thank you very much, Rabbi Breitowitz. I'll just say, it's, it's said by many that uh, one of the brachos of COVID is the fact that we can connect through Zoom. And it's, uh, I think, a special, special opportunity for us this morning. So many are on, uh, both the we all enjoy the content of what you say very much, but like Stuart said before, I think so many of us have very significant personal connections with you from the past. So it's, any opportunity to reconnect with you is always cherished by so many in the Kepmill community, in the Woodside community, and so many others. And also Yashikoach to Stuart for continuing to arrange uh, this wonderful series. Thank you very much. Um, people can feel free to send questions in through the chat just to, to highlight a few questions. Um, Rabbi Breitwitz, you spoke beautifully about sort of the national... Uh, this nation coming to, to its spot on the road, that nation coming to its spot on the road, sort of heading towards Gogu Magog, end of days. Yeah. Someone was curious where Amalek fits in with all of this. Yes, yes, that's a very, very good question. I actually did have a uh, part of that I wanted to address, but uh, I didn't because of time. Uh, there is a concept, although it's hard to figure it out in the Yichus, that Amalek represents the Chibor, the unification of Esav and Yishmael. Uh, and indeed, Kabbalistically, it's demonstrated in a very complicated way. Let me tell you very quickly. Uh, Esav is called Shor, the ox, and uh, Yishmael is called Chamor. If you take the middle level, middle letter of Shor, that's Vav, and the two middle letters of Chamor is Memvav, that gives you 52. 52 is the gematria of Kelem, dog, and Amalek is called the dog. So Kabbalistically, Amalek is a mizug of the hatred of Ishmael and the hedonism of Asa. And that's kind of the double whammy. And that is, that is Amalek. Now, I do want to mention one, one other point, though, also a positive point. Chazal tell us, Yishmael will do tshuva. Or Yishmael did tshuva, right? Yishmael himself did tshuva. So the Swarim say, the nation of Yishmael will do tshuva. And once again, 
I think there's an implication with the Abrahamic Accords, which it may very well be that United Arab Emirates is not acting with Shema, they may be doing it for economic uh, motives and the like, but still, the fact that there are two Chabad houses, I think, in the UAH and kosher restaurants and Minyanim, uh, maybe is a good sign of Yishmael moving away from Islamic fundamentalism towards a model of Chuba. So that I think may be a hopeful sign as well. Thank you very much. Any other, uh, any other questions? There's many thank yous in the chat. <laughs> People are very grateful, <laughs> rightfully so. Um, I have a comment, I guess I'd like me to discuss. You mentioned, of course, how Eretz Israel has, has been infertile for all the years the Jews have been away and now has blossomed once again. I think the Torah itself says that in the Tochachad. Is it not that that will be the case and that it will change? Uh, yes, yes. The, the Torah says that uh, while you are off the land, the land will be desolate and abandoned. And that'll, that'll be the way that all the Shemitahs you didn't observe are going to be observed. Right. And the land resting, the implication is you come back to the land, it will flower, it will come back again. And once again, we, we, we mamish have seen that in the history of Eretz Israel. You know, Eretz Israel has been <laughs> occupied by hostile nations for many, many, many years. Uh, Christians, Muslims, uh, Ottomans, British, and until the Jewish people come back, it, it does not yield its fertility. Uh, someone, someone was curious if China fits in anywhere in uh, from this total vantage point in terms of the world screen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, uh, China is a big, big elephant in the room here. Uh, so many things that are going on in the world are connected directly or indirectly to China. COVID, COVID uh, among them. Uh, it's a little hard to trace a little bit. I mean, there, there are sources of Sajigong that do connect the Chinese to the children of Keturah who come from Hogar, and therefore they are the brothers of Yishmael. So they can actually trace a Yishmael aspect in China as well. Uh, although it's not Yishmael, but Keturah, but that's close enough because Keturah is Hogar. So the B'nai uh, Keturah are essentially brothers, direct brothers of Yishmael, full brothers of Yishmael. So there would be that Chinese connection. Thank you. I think I Rabbi, there's someone with a hand up. Um, Ms. Okay. Yelenek, can you call on her, please? Okay, Ms. Yelenek, you're right. Hi, thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank, God here, thank God I'm in Israel, so I'm very happy to see all my Kempnell friends and especially to be sharing this moment with Rabbi Breidort, who the Yelenek's very much esteem and love. So I have a question with all this messianism, which is a little bit uh, in itself kind of a mystical question. If the rabbi would uh, comment, um, if it's not too far out, is there, uh, are there parallels that Rabbi Breider would seize between these times and, um, and the first century of the common era in terms of, um, in terms of just the explosion of spirituality and the talk of messianism? Um, there's the question. Well, well you know, again, uh, we, we have always found throughout Jewish history, in both positive and negative ways, when there's major, major tensions in the world, the breakout of war, disease, plague, famine, that there will tend to be a tremendous yearning for redemption and for, for Geula. Uh, sometimes that has led to tragic consequences like Shabzai Tzvi after the Khamenitsky massacre. But other times, if it, if it leads to Torah learning, to Tzaka, to Abbat Yisrael, it can be channeled in positive ways. So I think we have to be very careful. Yearning for Mashiach can be a tremendously powerful and positive motivator in spiritual life. But you can also take it in a wrong direction. So for example, if somebody were to tell me as some people say, let's blow up the Mosque of Omar and reclaim the Temple Mount. I would, I and I, th I think of virtually no God that I'm aware of, uh, would support that type of messianism. But if it motivates us to do tshuva and to turn to Hashem, then that's one of the important yearnings. Remember, after 120 years, Hashem is going to ask us, see peace of the Yeshua. That doesn't mean, did you believe in Mashiach? See peace, did you yearn for it? Did you, you know, want it in the depths of your heart? 
And I think if there's any silver lining to Tsaros that we're going through, it creates a greater yearning for Mashiach. And that's a wonderful, that's, that itself is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Thank you. Thank you. Ellie, did you uh, want to bye say bye. something? Can I ask a question? Yeah, hi, Ellie, how are you? Yeah. Hi, Rabbi. This is Elia Cheskin. How are you? Hi, uh, How does God decide to manifest his hand on everything we do? Uh, say again, I didn't hear. Say again, how does he decide? How does God manifest his hand yeah. in anything we do? Well, you know, you're, 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 you're hitting on the, the question I alluded to, and that is, on one hand, human beings are creatures of free will, and God does not make me do anything. God uh, allows me to make the choice to be good or evil, but he does have a predetermined plan for how he wants historical processes to come out. So God is matching up the, he's like a chess master. He's matching up the billions of moves of individuals and coordinates them to achieve a certain result. It's, it's a very complex process. Basically, we can't understand it at all because how can you take independent actors and somehow coordinate them to some predetermined result? That seems to be a mutually inconsistent, two inconsistent premises, but that's kind of how God is operating. All so right. It's a, it's a Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Rabbi, I'm going to send you something, okay? Okay, looking forward. Good to see you. Thank Take you. Care. Nice seeing you again. Yeah, be well. Okay, maybe Thanks. Al, maybe this will be the last uh, question, I think. Al? Yes, Rabbi Breidowitz, it's Chaim Neustadter. Oh, uh, Shalom Aleichem. It, it is so good to hear from you, Aleichem Shalom. So back to the first question that you posed. Uh, if someone goes into a 7-Eleven, and the robber, you know, shoots him. But but at the last minute, the robber does tshuva and yeah. walks away. Are we saying, from from the point of view of, of Hashkafa, that the person would have died at that moment a different way? I mean, yeah, you pose yeah. that question. Yeah. Yes, yes, it is. A, it is a fascinating question, a difficult question. I mean, that's almost. And to make it even more extreme, if Hitler wouldn't have uh, uh, done the Holocaust, uh, would six million people somehow die? Uh, out of natural causes. So let me just say that the Kitzer, this seems to be, seems to be a machlokas between the great Sefer Chovas Halavavos and the commentary of the Or HaChayim. Uh, the Chovas Halavavos does take Hachach of Pratis to a very extreme way. And he says, the guy, would, the guy would have died anyway. The guy would have died anyway, even if the robber wouldn't have pulled the trigger. That's what the Chovas Halavavos says. The Arachayim seems to say that because God created a world of Bechira, by definition, Bechira has a certain freedom to produce certain results that would not have happened without that Bechira. So essentially, it, it is a machlokas. I don't know if we can determine any, any halacha here, but it is a major, major issue that uh, Jewish thinkers uh, debate. And, and, uh, right, and, and within that context, I think we also have to wonder about, you know, Hashem controls the exact moment that a person enters this world and leaves this world. So, so you know, the person was meant to die at that moment. Did it change in real time? So, so that's the issue. In other words, the Chavis HaLobobos says that God determines when you leave the world. So no human being can change that. That's the Chavis HaLobobos. Uh, the Arachayim seems to suggest that once you're within the ambit of other people's choices, those things right. can change. Now, I will and tell then, you, and then Hashem's Hashem's uh, future for the for the other person in this equation can change as well. It, it then, can then all change. Yeah, well, once one thing changes, it's like a ripple effect. <laughs> then everything right. changes. I will okay, tell you this: you. that many many people feel that this Arachayim. Uh, is either misunderstood or we cannot accept it. It's a very controversial Orichayim. The mainstream Jewish Havana is uh, the Chavetz Halavavos. Uh, so uh, if that makes a difference. Um, Thank you. There's a book, many of you might know, uh, Rabbi Akiva Tatz, very uh, eminent uh, writer, scholar, lecturer. He's also an MD. He wrote a very excellent book on free will in English. That, you know, If you're interested in these questions, you could check. And he addresses the Arachayim and the Chavos Halavavos at great length. 
Thank you. Uh, Rabbi, there was one question I did see pass by earlier, and I would want to ask you this, if you don't mind, that yeah. is there a grounds for differentiating between Eretz Israel and Medina Israel? How do we how do we feel about that today? Okay, well, I, I didn't address that at all. Uh, as you know, Eretz Yisrael and Medina Yisrael are two different things. Uh, we celebrated uh, last month uh, in Eor, uh, Yom Atzmaut, and then at the end of Eor, Yom Yerushalayim. Uh, as you know, in a lot of the yeshiva world, Yom Atzmaut is not necessarily designated. Um, this gets us into a very, very complicated question. Uh, is Hakamat Hamid, right? You know, Jews are supposed to live in Eretz Israel. Okay, that's a given. Uh, but are Jews supposed to have a state? Is the establishment of a statehood an inherent good? Uh, and that's really a machlokas. You know, the Turi Karta, which today might be a, you know, a little fringe group, but the truth is their position was largely mainstream before 1948, among many, many segments of orthodoxy, took the position that Hakamat Medina must await the coming of Moshiach, and it was wrong to establish a political state. Uh, and they based it on a famous passage in Maseches Ksuvas Kufir Aleph, which I won't go into right now. And as a result, Hakamat Medina is either against halacha or does not have a religious significance. On the other hand, there is a position attributed to the Chafetz Chaim, who uh, died before the state, but nevertheless, and Rav Meir Simcha, that it is not just living in Israel that's an important thing, but the, uh, the establishment of a Jewish state is an important gift from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And I believe, according to the language of the Ramban, would even be a mitzvah. I mean, it, it seems fairly clear to me that when the Ramban defines Yishuv Eretz Yisrael as a mitzvah, which he does, it is not only living in Israel, but it is the establishment of Jewish sovereignty in Eretz Yisrael. So even if you don't view the state, you know, in, in, the, in the Tfilah L'Shlom HaMedina that, I don't know if your show says it, but the, you know, so many shall say it, there is a controversial phrase, the most controversial phrase, and that is, Reshit Smichat Gulatena. It is the beginning of the flowering or the growth of our redemption. Those are loaded words because that's taking a position that Hakamat HaMedina is a stage in messianic redemption. Now, there are those that say the prayer in Shlom Medina, and they omit those three words. They don't want to take a position on the messianic implications of the state, but they still view it as something positive. So you really have three different views. You have a view that says it's against halacha. You have a view that says the other extreme, that it is part of the messianic process that will bring the Mashiach. And then you have an intermediate view that I think many B'nai Torah subscribe to, and that is, it is something that is we're grateful for. It gives the Jewish people a homeland. It gives us a place to go to, uh, but we don't necessarily view it as a definitive step towards Mashiach, right? So you can look at Medinat Yisrael in different, in different ways. Thank you, Rabbi. You've addressed so many important questions and so beautifully and, and insightfully. We thank you so much. Thank you I'll, so much, and that you all be well, good health, and we should see each other, and only smachot. Yes, indeed. Thank you again for joining us today. Please tune in again on Sunday, July 24th at 10.30 a.m., when we will hear from Mrs. Sharon Freundell on the topic of seeing Hashem's hand in our daily lives. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Robert Breitowitz. All the best to all.